I want to talk about the coming joy. The coming joy. Joy has come, but joy is going to come again. <laughs> Amen? His name is Jesus. And he's coming again. Turn to Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing, governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had to go register where, where and I was born, I'd have to go to Dallas. And to be quite honest with you, I don't want to go to Dallas. Many of you would have to go far away too, probably further than that. Mine would have to go all the way to Vietnam. <laughs> Verse 4, And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and then she gave birth to her first son, son, firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them at the lodging place or the inn. And in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And today a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and laying in a feeding trough. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people he favors. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for keeping it for us. Thank you, Lord, for preserving it. And now we ask that you would illuminate it to our hearts that we would grow in grace and grow in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, I could spend a lot of time talking about um, Mary being pregnant and, uh, and talk a lot about the uh, marriage customs, but <clears throat> you probably know them and I want to talk about uh, Joseph today anyway. We may talk about Mary next week. I don't know. We'll see. But I want to talk about Joseph today because just reading about Joseph and his life has really uh, impressed me to think about who I am in Christ and what I am as a born-again believer. And so I want, to, I want to talk about Joseph today. Keep in mind that the Scriptures... Uh, describing um, the, the, the advent or the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, they, they have become so familiar to us that we tend to read through them without really truly contemplating the meaning and, and, and trying to understand exactly what he's saying to us. You know, the saying, familiarity breeds contempt, I think that's probably most true with the Christmas story. We just read through the Christmas story and, yeah, we've heard that before and we've read that before and, and we really don't look into what the scriptures are saying. So I want, us to, I want us to really pay attention to scripture today because I believe God has a word for us. Not just uh, the men because we're focused on Joseph, but for every person in this place. 
when it comes to Joseph and Joseph's life, remember that for 400 years, God had not spoken. The prophets had been silent. And so for 400 years, the, we, we find the faithful Israel has been praying and asking and resting in the promise of the Old Testament for the coming of the Messiah. For example, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will, be, will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. That was from the Holman Christian standard. And to me, that, that's a pretty good picture of what joy is all about. It just kind of makes you want to playfully jump around like you would see calves, uh, newborn calves out in the pasture. The people prayed every day for the redemption of Israel. 400 years go by. Well, let me ask you something. How long have you been praying about an issue? I bet it ain't been 400 years. The people of Israel, though, from one generation to the next, handed that anticipation down to one another, and they prayed and prayed for 400 years, and God has been silent. We remember what Malachi said, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. You remember he's talking about John the Baptist coming and proclaiming the way. And then we recall what Isaiah said, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth the desert a highway for our God. And then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, not having heard anything from the Lord in 400 years, it's just hard for me to, I know there have been times when I've given up on praying about an issue. Am, am I the only one? Have you, have you had that experience where you just felt like, well, he's not going to answer me anyway, so the, the answer, I'm just going to think that the answer is no and, and let it go. Have you had, ever had that experience? These people would not turn loose of the promise that the Messiah was coming, that their king and their savior was coming. They wouldn't turn it loose. I, I have to confess, there have been times that I've had to just, I thought I, it was just time to quit praying about an issue that it wasn't going to happen. I was talking to and someone in the hospital just this past week, and they, I, I don't remember all of the conversation, but I remember this. They, uh, they were talking about how praying to the Lord, and in this case it was praying for a healing, and and they talked about how sometimes the Lord just seems to move so slow. He just moves so slow. And then this person said, but you know what? I ain't never figured out how to outrun him. <laughs> now, if you, yeah, if you think about it, that's pretty good, isn't it? So for 400 years, they haven't heard from God. Well, let's pick up the Christmas story now. 400 years later in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, look at me, look with me at verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, in this day, the ladies were betrothed to the men sometimes at a very, just in childhood. They were promised. And dad would always pay a dowry for uh, his son to marry this young girl someday. Well, Mary and Joseph were not actually married as we know marriage today. They were engaged, but they had not consummated their, their wedding, their marriage. The, the wedding, uh, the, the wedding uh, ceremony, thank you, the wedding ceremony had not happened yet. It would happen whenever Joseph, and a lot of times whenever Joseph's dad said, son, go get your bride. 
a lot of times that's the way it would happen. And so he would go and, and get his bride to be and take her back to their place and they would have a big party for a week or so and then uh, and they would consummate the, the, the marriage and they would have been then they would have been as we know, married today they have been married. Th this was an engagement which was just as binding as uh, a legal wedding. Just as by in order to break an engagement, they'd have to get a legal writing of divorcement. While they are in this engagement period, Mary is found with child by Holy Spirit. Verse 19, so her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, so in other words, I don't know how many days, I don't know how long. I just, I just have, maybe I'm reading between the lines. Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. And uh, maybe didn't find out, maybe just Mary just openly told him and it was more than he could understand at the time. And so he labored over this. And I, I don't know how long it may have been. It may have been weeks. It may, I don't know how long, it, but he was trying to understand and figure out what he had to do. What, what should he do in this case? The marriage had not been consummated. Mary is pregnant and he doesn't understand pregnant by Holy Spirit. He didn't get that at all. So he's praying about it. He's thinking about it. Verse 20. But after he had considered these things, and I don't know how long, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is by Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet when he said, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him, and he married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. If God decided to send his son to earth again to be born a baby as he did in this day, I want to ask us all a question, me included, I want to ask us a, a question here today. Would God choose our home as the birthplace or the birth people of his son? Have you ever really thought about it like that? Would he choose my home? Would he choose your home? Because it just seems to me, why, why do you suppose that he, that he chose Mary and Joseph? How, how, did, how did that happen? It would seem to me that he could have chosen anyone but Joseph and Mary. He could have chosen someone who was very prominent. He could have chosen someone who was maybe a priest or a rabbi, a prophet, a ruler. It, it, it seems that he would surely want his son to be taken care of. It would seem to me that God would want his son to be financially cared for. I mean, after all, it takes a lot of money to run a campaign, right? It would seem to me that he would want his son to be educated by the best. It, it, would, it would seem, but he chose... A carpenter. Now, if you're a carpenter here today, don't. <laughs> I'm, I don't mean anything derogatory about this. But he chose a poor carpenter, and his and his present peasant, excuse me, his peasant engaged wife. He chose them. We know that because if you read in Luke chapter 2, if you read in Luke chapter 2, beginning about verse 24, uh, they brought Jesus into the temple to dedicate him, and they brought with them the offering of a poor, 
for a family to dedicate their first male child, which was two turtle doves or two pigeons, two young pigeons. That was the offering of the poor to dedicate their firstborn son in the temple. So we know that they were a poor family. He was a common working man from this little nothing village of Nazareth, not from the elite of Jerusalem. Why did he choose Joseph? And if he were going to do it again, would he choose Mike Scott? Would he choose you? Hmm. Well, this morning, I want us to focus on the kind of person the, the person with the character that God would choose, his perfect will, to choose a, a, a family who, who would live to his honor and his glory. Are, are you, am I, are we as a people of God, are we living for the glory of God? Are we just kind of living for ourselves, going through the motions? Well, let's... Let's think about this for a minute. First of all, when you look at Joseph's life, here's what you find. He was a just man. Look at verse 19 again. It says, so her husband Joseph being a righteous man or a just man. What do you, what do you think it means to be a just man? That's what he says here in the scriptures. So from a Jewish point of view, from the Jewish point of view, a just man was a strict observer of the law of Moses and the rabbinical traditions of their day. Psalm 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. A just man is someone who is honest. He's honest about himself. He's honest with himself, but he's also honest before the Lord. And, it, and because he is, God directs his steps and he is blessed. God delights in his way. A just man is not deceptive. He doesn't deceive people. He doesn't defraud people. He doesn't cheat people. He's an honest man. Not only that, he was a gentleman. Again in verse 19, he wasn't willing to put his wife away, although he was perfectly within his right to do so. Did you know that the law... The, the law in Leviticus chapter 20, let me see if I put this up here. I did. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Wouldn't you say that this, this would pertain to Mary? Kind of looks that way, doesn't it? According to the, to the eyes and to the mind of the world, to the people around them, they deserve stoning, right? Mary and the man she committed adultery with. She was pregnant. Obviously, she'd committed adultery. But because Joseph was a just man, and Scripture says he was, he was a gentle man, not willing to put her away. Listen, he, he was within his right to do so, but he didn't. Why? Because he was a disciplined man. Look at verse 24. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the, Lord, uh, the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her. The angel told him, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife. Joseph lived a life of obedience to the scriptures. Joseph walked with God. He obeyed the scriptures. And that's why God chose, those are some of the reasons why God chose Joseph to, to be the to, to be the father, if you will, not the, not the physical father of Jesus, but to raise him. Because Joseph was a godly man. He was a disciplined man. And whenever things were not right in his life, Joseph got them right. He obeyed the word of God. He obeyed the, the law and the precepts of Scripture. We know that because if you go back to Luke 22, he brought in the, the required offering to dedicate Jesus in the temple. But not only that, he was a courageous, he was a spiritual man. What, what, what do we mean by spiritual? 
To you, what is a spiritual man? Isn't it somebody whose life is not whose life is not lived in accordance with the culture and the world around him? It is a man who lives his life according to the scriptures. Paul said this about, he described two people, actually three people, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, last part of 2, and chapter 3. In chapter 2, verse 14, he says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. What he's saying is, is a person who is not indwelt by Holy Spirit, who has not been born again, who has not been saved, don't understand you Christians. They don't understand you. They don't understand why you would pray, because it is what it is, and it's going to be what it's going to be. Why pray? They don't understand why you give. Why would you go out and work hard all day long and then go to worship on the Lord's day and give? They don't understand that. Why would you do that? Why would you take a day, Sunday, the Lord's day, and not do this or that or the other, but come and assemble with the church together and worship? They don't, they don't understand that. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God because that's all a bunch of foolishness to them. They cannot know them because why? It is spiritually discerned. Verse 15 says, but the spiritual man judges or he discerns all things, yet is judged of no one. Chapter 3 talks about the carnal man, and that's another for another time. A spiritual man walks according to the things of God. He was a courageous man. Again in verse 24. I love this. Notice what he said. He married her but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son and he named him Jesus. He got up from his sleep, took a lot of courage. You say, well, why do you think that was courageous? Listen. Have you really thought about what kind of ridicule Joseph would have been under? I mean, here he is, and I, and I, I would just submit that, that I, just from reading through Scripture, I don't think Joseph made it any secret that he loved God and that he walked according to the Word. I don't think that was a secret. I don't think he tiptoed around that. I think he was not, not bold or arrogant about it, but he was confident in it. And whatever people thought of him spiritually, that was okay. But here, here now, he, he has taken a woman who is pregnant and just engaged. Marriage hadn't been consummated yet. Can you think of the ridicule that he was about to go through? You mean you're going to marry that? I won't say I better not say that. You're going to marry that Uzi? You're going to marry that? I mean, you... Really? Well, I don't, you know, he was a carpenter. I don't think I want you building my rocking chair if you're going to sleep around with or, or, let, or marry some woman that's just sleeping around. I, don't, I, I think it would have ruined his reputation. I think it would have ruined his career in Nazareth as a carpenter. I think he would have suffered ridicule on every turn. I don't know that he would have even been allowed back into the temple, Brother Jody. I don't, I don't know that. But it took a lot of courage to do what Joseph did. He was a man of courage. Now, if God was looking for a place for his boy Jesus, the Savior, to be born, would he choose your home, Dad? Would he choose your home, men? I think there is an awful lot that we could say about Joseph and his character, but I, I'm going to close with just a few things, one more thing, which I have a few things to say about that. He was a righteous man. Verse 19 20 says that uh, he loved, he loved uh, Mary, her, her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her publicly. He's gentle, compassionate, uh, loving husband, decided 
to divorce her secretly. In other words, I'm not going to make a big scene out of this. I'm not going to embarrass her. I'm not going to bring disgrace upon her and her family. And then he says, and then it says, verse 20, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by Holy Spirit. Joseph didn't follow situational ethics. I'm afraid there are a lot of people in our world today that just kind of live their life according to situational ethics. Whatever feels good, whatever looks good under a certain set of circumstances, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And though he could have been humiliated and poor Mary could have been humiliated and stoned, but he was kind and compassionate, would not allow that to happen. He was a righteous man. He was a man of conviction. Here's where the rubber meets the road, right? Here's where I'm going to make application. He was a man of conviction, not preference. Do you know the difference? <clears throat> conviction, well, let's look at preference. Preference is a choice based on desires, likes, whatever I like, whatever makes me feel good, whatever works to my advantage, that's what I'm going to do. That's preference. Conviction is different. Conviction is a principle to which I am committed regardless of the circumstances. And I can think of a lot of cases in the Bible. There's Daniel when threatened with being thrown into the lion's den. His conviction was that he would not bow a knee to any false god, even if it meant being devoured alive by lions. It was a principle to which he was committed regardless of the circumstances. Those three Hebrew children that were cast into the fiery furnace were not going to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's God. They'd rather die in a fiery furnace. They said, if God delivers us, so be it. But if he doesn't, he's still God and we will not bow. That's conviction. Amen? Now, what happens whenever you're torn with preference? There's always going to be compromise, right? Here's what compromise is. Compromise is an adjustment for settlement by arbitration. And mutual concession usually involving a partial surrender of purposes or principles. Now, compromise in some cases is good. When it comes to the marriage, sometimes you've got to compromise, right, to keep peace. Sometimes you got to give a little. Amen? Sometimes you take a little, but you got to give a little. Sometimes you may never really agree on the issue, but you've got to compromise somewhere. And in that way, compromise is good. You, we got to learn how to love one another and live together and live in peace and harmony. And sometimes we got to compromise. My wife likes, likes 77 degrees in the house. That's a little too warm for me. And so when I go to bed at night, I'm usually always the first one to go to bed. I'm old, and I need more rest, and I wake up early, and so I generally go to bed early. Well, she, she compromises, and she'll turn it down to 75 just for me. <laughs> oh, it's 73. Okay, well. <laughs> the, the other day, she went to town, and and she bought me this little fan and she, so I could put it on my end table right where I sit in my recliner. And that's so if, if I get too warm, I can just turn on my little fan and it can. That's compromise. And sometimes compromise is a good thing. Amen? <laughs> Mark, y'all got it going on in your house too? <laughs> Compromise can be a bad thing, too. <clears throat> Compromise well, 
Maybe I've said enough about that. Aren't you glad? Think about Joseph for a minute, the, in the Old Testament Joseph. Joseph, you recall, was, was in, sold into slavery by his own brothers, and then uh, and he sold into a, a group of Midianites, and then the Midianites took him and sold him into slavery to Potiphar, and then Potiphar's wife made a pass at him. And, and in fact, let me, let me just flip over there right quick. I want to read you something here. It's in Genesis chapter, well, Joseph's story starts in chapter 37, where he had this dream that caused his brothers to get mad, and they, they threw him in a pit, and we're going to kill him. Matter of fact, till Reuben said, no, wait a minute, we can't do that. It, let's don't just kill him, let's get something for him. Let's sell him. So they sold him to the Midianites. The Midianites took him to Potiphar. And in chapter 39, uh, verse 1, Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard brought him in from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving the household of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor in his master's sight, so he became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed it all under his, uh, under his authority. Now, I, I guess I would too. Somebody came into my business and I could see that truly uh, the Lord was with him. I'd say, yeah, let's give him, let's give him all kinds of authority. If he's going to bless him, he's going to bless me too. Smart dude, right? Notice what happened. <clears throat> now Joseph was well built. We're in last part of chapter six, or verse six. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after some time, his master's wife looked longingly on Joseph and said, "Sleep with me." But he refused. And look, he said to his master's wife. With me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do such great evil and sin against God? Aren't you glad Joseph didn't compromise? What, what do you think would have happened? Later on, we find out that a great famine was coming. Seven years of famine was coming. Joseph, God put Joseph in a place where he could deliver not just the Egyptians, but all of Israel, that, that, uh, all, of, all of Joseph's family. He, he delivered them from that famine. Then later, of course, it was several years later, they became enslaved to Egypt, but he delivered them. Then you have the enslavement, then you have Moses leading them free and so forth and so on. So he was, um, oh, let me, let me share this with you about compromise. Do be, he says, be careful to do what the Lord God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. In other words, don't compromise. Stick to your convictions and your principles. Psalm 119.3, joyful are those who do not compromise with evil then they walk only in his paths. Aren't you glad Joseph did? So a person of conviction always has a greater cause than himself. Look at verse 24 back in our text. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. A person of conviction always has a cause greater than himself. Now, I took you back to Joseph in the Old Testament, but the same is true of this Joseph. Joseph of the Old Testament, think what, what would have happened had he not had a cause greater than himself. He, he could have been unfaithful. He, he, could have, he could have accepted Potiphar's wife's invitation and slept with her. He could have had anything he wanted under Potiphar. But he would not compromise. He was a man of conviction, and there was a cause Whatever that plan was that God had for his life was greater than himself. But not only that, Joseph had clarity of conviction. Listen, when the angel spoke to him, 
Doesn't say he questioned him or argued with him. It says when Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He had clarity of conviction. He knew what he was supposed to do. Well, let me ask you, Dad, Mom, what, what are your convictions and are they clear? Do, do you have any convictions about about the Word of God? Do you have any convictions about the church of God? Do you have any convictions about the indwelling Holy Spirit? Do you have any convictions about sin and what sin does? Do you have any convictions about, about righteousness? Can you clearly state what those convictions are? For, let me give you an example. I believe that the Word of God is the one and only holy Word of the one and only holy God forever established in heaven. Is that your, or is your conviction of the Word of God, is it like that of the world? Well, there, there, there's error mixed in there. Really? Then, then who's smart enough to figure out what's error and what's not? Do you have a conviction about the Word of God? Do you have a conviction about the indwelling Holy Spirit? That He is just some kind of force that is the force be with you out there? Or that He is, he, he is Holy God living in you? We talked about that in our Sunday school class this morning. How awesome is that? That Almighty Creator, Holy, Omnipotent, Omnipresent God is living in you. In the people who have trusted him. That is an incredible thing, people. I wish I could live up to that. Do you have clarity of your convictions? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Prob written by Solomon, and probably Joseph knew this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. How do you think it, this deal would have went, the birth of the Christ, had Joseph leaned on his own understanding about this whole pregnancy thing with Mary? Think about him in all your ways, and he will guide you on the right path. If I could just speak to our teenage world today and our young adult world today, if I could just speak to them today and beg them, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable act of service or worship, and be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, and perfect, and acceptable will of God. Oh, that I could speak with our young people today. Just this past week, we learned where a, a mother went into the bedroom of a 14-year-old daughter and found a 15-year-old boy in a bed with her. Oh, if they only knew the mistakes they were making. Dreadful mistakes. Joseph was committed to the consequences. He didn't know what was going to happen. But he was committed, regardless of the circumstances. He was committed to the consequences. <clears throat> Why? Why? Because he had total confidence in the sovereignty of God. Do you believe that God is in control? What about when the bad things happen? Is God in control? Are you sure? Are you sure? God is in control. Now we may look at our world and think, <laughs> ain't no way my God's in control of all. Oh, yes, he is. I didn't say he condones anything. He didn't approve of a lot of this stuff. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying God's in control. And if you think he is absent from the scene, you better think again. He, it's impossible for him to be absent from the scene. He, he can't because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. He knows. He is omniscient. omniscient. 
He is omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Don't think God doesn't know where you are and what's going on in your life. You say, well, God don't seem to be doing anything about it. Well, wait a minute. Before you accuse him of not doing his part, why don't you start doing your part? Amen? Whoo! Because I believe when you start doing your part, he'll finish his part. Amen? Do you know the scripture says that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Do you know, do you know the Bible says that? Amen? So he knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you need. And so I want to go back to that first question. If God were going to send his son to be born again, would he choose your home? 